Dr. Mahanama Gunasekara from Sri Lanka is a past president, College of Surgeon of Sri Lanka, chairman, specialty board in general surgery, PGIM, consultant, general surgeon, National Hospital, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Dr. Mahanama, please. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Katyar, for that kind of introduction. Uh, firstly, I must congratulate uh, Dr. Irene Madrid and Guru for the excellent presentation and uh, sharing the wealth of experience gained um, with while uh, in one of the landmark uh, urban warfare incidents has happened during the recent past in, in, in the whole world, I suppose. And uh, then sharing her uh, uh, experience again while her own personal um, um, uh, safety is threatened, the family safety is threatened, as well as the healthcare institution uh, uh, in the city itself is threatened. And um, she highlighted the, the difficulties that we face in, in urban warfare in retrieving casualties. And of course, uh, getting patients to the hospital and, uh, uh, and when there's a large population involved, a small number reached initially the hospital. So therefore, she had to have the outreach, the value of outreach uh, uh, teams, teaching the patients and then providing them with care uh, was highlighted. Uh, at the same time, uh, she also, uh, highlighted the importance of coordination uh, and getting the medical administration and uh, the, the hospital administration involved in organizing in an unpredictable event like this. At the same time, how unpredictable it was, and it was initially planned for three days and which expanded over five months, and only a small percentage reached hospitals and then how, he had, how she had to gather resources, which includes the transport systems, students, volunteers, to take care of the patients. At the same time, she also highlighted the value of training and it, how, what a blessing it was to have uh, uh, the opportunity to have trained the teams while the disaster or the, uh, the warfare was going on. And this brings to our attention that how uh, this modern, uh, how these special situations where these uh, in, in an urban environment, how the warfare or disaster or a terrorist attack is a very special challenge. Uh, they are confined spaces. And then of course, uh, casualty retrieval is a unique problem. And at the same time, transport, providing pre-hospital care, as well as maintaining the institutions which are also under threat, maybe due to natural disaster or even a man-made disaster. And because of the changing pattern of uh, uh, injuries, mainly due to in, in terrorist attacks, uh, mainly due to the, uh, the different, uh, different tactics that are used, different uh, destructive methods that are used, how uh, the, how the uh, injury pattern changes, and in each time, we the, when when how unpredictable uh, the situation is, and and where uh, the medical teams are not ready to face similar activities. So, therefore, the value of epidemiology in uh, disaster and warfare situations is a unique thing. And uh, similar to uh, the difficulties that we face in treating such patients, even the gathering information and maintaining epidemiological data. Uh, and completeness of data is always a problem in a disaster situation. It could be the by it could be a disaster or an unmanageable situation, a situation which cannot be coped as a result of the number of the patients involved, or the location, or the or the nature of the disaster, or else otherwise it hazards involved, um, and and the medical teams uh, uh, involved and the facilities, medical facilities available. And of course, the infrastructure available for, uh, for gathering information and record keeping. 
However, the value of record keeping is, it cannot be underestimated on any of these circumstances. That is the main tool for research purposes. And therefore, I think uh, Asian collaboration of Roma and all of us has to design methodology to gather information in this unfortunate, during these unfortunate situations, because it is time for us to be prepared the, for these similar unfortunate events that is quite possibly could take place in Asia in the future. So therefore, uh, uh, we must be ready for the changing pattern of illnesses and, and training our, uh, our, colleague, our colleagues as well as the younger generation. And we had the same problem. Uh, uh, I have the experience in uh, the warfare in Sri Lanka from 1990 to 2009. We, we, we have received several large number of mass casual incidents, more than 50 in our own institution in the National Hospital Colombo. And uh, recently we had a similar uh, unexpected one after nine years of absence of mass casual incidents, terrorist attacks in April 2019, two years, uh, half about, around two years after the Marawi incident. Um, so we, uh, it was quite a different tactic, which you never saw during the 30 year old war. So that they are, there were six explosions in uh, six different sites. Three were religious institutions where there was mass gathering during prayers. And the other three were hotels full of tourists during the vacation. So therefore, they are there. And, and all these six blasts took place within a very short period, less than one hour an old reach our institution and we had 253 casualties and more than five, uh, 253 dead and more than 500 casualties received in a very short period of time. I think this type of uh, um, data is very useful, the management protocols that was used as well as the outcome measurements. So again, I must thank uh, Dr. Irene and Guru for this ex their excellent presentation as well as I must thank the uh, Asian uh, collaboration of trauma and the chairman, uh, Professor uh, Ronald um, uh, De La Cruz, as well as the, all the organizers. Thank you very much. The next day after is Dr. Pawan Sharma, who will be giving his thoughts on the talk of Dr. Amir Koramanesh. He is a professor of surgery con and consultant, trauma and critical care, Armed Forces Medical College, Pune, India. He had his fellowship in trauma and critical care surgery, JPN, Apex Trauma Center, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, fellow of the American College of Surgeons, International College of Surgeons, and International College of Laparoscopic Surgeons. He is an ATLS Force Director since 2015 and instructor since 2012. Uh, Dr. Pawan Sharma. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, first of all, I have to thank all the organizers uh, of the Asian Collaboration of Trauma to give me this uh, unique opportunity to be part of this forum. And uh, <clears throat> my compliments uh, and uh, congratulations is to uh, Dr. Amit Koram uh, for uh, bringing out uh, the various aspects of, uh, uh, the, of his topic that he dealt with the training physicians and healthcare workers in disaster management, rather disaster preparedness and uh, response, the core competencies. Uh, uh, he has dealt with the topic in a very systematic and a very precise manner. And uh, at the same time, he has elaborated on the role of uh, you know, uh, simulation training and uh, simulation uh, models. And uh, while well, responding to a, a disaster situation, this uh, I would probably uh, put communication very high on the card because communication is in very integral and uh, part and parcel of uh, any response, initial response. And it's an ongoing process and uh, it starts with the, a good communication, it ends with a good communication. At the same time as the gentleman, from, uh, the speaker has brought out uh, like uh, the major you know, obstacle or the major hurdle in any disaster response is the crowd. So the crowd control itself uh, is a very major task where uh, he is, Dr. Amir has brought out in terms of uh, the administration and its role. So it has to be highlighted uh, because they are the people who are going to, you know, 
create a lot of uh, difficulties for you to manage any disaster scenario. And uh, testing qualities and uh, probably uh, these processes, what uh, Dr. Foram has suggested is always an ongoing process. And uh, since each disaster is very, very unique in itself, uh, it's very difficult to generalize, it's very difficult to predict that how a disaster is going to uh, affect a, a city or a community or whether it is uh, uh, you know, terrorist uh, activity or it's in the peacetime, a natural disaster is highly unpredictable as the most of the, uh, the eminent speakers and organizers would agree. So it's you know, uh, difficult actually to you know, create a one uh, size fits all type of scenario so it has to be probably a region specific or a country specific identifying their own uh, predictable uh, disasters and uh, you know, tailor made their own uh, response. Though we need a certain uh, general guideline uh, in this regard that where uh, we need to have bare minimum guidelines or protocols to follow. That way I think he's uh, brought out uh, this uh, uh, simulation model and uh, the, the um, simulation training. And uh, it's an, since it's an ongoing process, so we need to, I think, uh, uh, go by what he has uh, rightly suggested, have uh, in, in the, in the peacetime or during the non-disaster situation, uh, bring out certain core competencies by uh, the simulation model, which is highly uh, uh, appreciable what he has uh, brought out. And uh, again, uh, he's also brought out the, uh, the the, the competency to you know, assess the type of injuries uh, where he has suggested uh, particularly the, to assess them by uh, injury severity scoring system, which may be uh, probably I feel a little uh, cumbersome for uh, in such a situation. So it should be you know, kept very simple, uh, like uh, we are all have been doing and traditionally like just giving some priority or a priority tag in terms of whether it's uh, a red, yellow, or green tag to start with, uh, because most of this strike is going to take place in the field situations. So uh, wasting uh, time in uh, elaborating injuries and you know, assessing their uh, ISS or NISS is not going to be probably a good idea to start with. We can always tag them, you know, uh, uh, red, uh, uh, yellow, and uh, green to start with, so that we can at least, you know, straight to segregate all those greens, uh, which the previous speaker has nicely brought out, which are almost uh, you know, two third or 70 to 80% of all the casualties, which, and uh, usually they are the ones who interfere in your uh, management process. And uh, it's also suggested various types of uh, uh, this simulation model, uh, which is uh, again, a great idea, like your total or functional or concept and uh, you know planning. The simulation has uh, you know, it, its own uh, uh, merits, uh, but again, it has got its own uh, limitation because it really cannot uh, simulate the real uh, life-like situations. So we should uh, you know, try to emulate it to some extent, but yes, we need to have more of uh, you know, actual, uh, uh, some kind of model where actual uh, this disaster drills are conducted regularly. I had this uh, you know, great opportunity to visit uh, Israel uh, around uh, 10 years back, where as a part of that international trauma course and they uh, uh, conducted, which, uh, which uh, just showed us that underground facility uh, of the car parking facility where it, it can be you know, converted uh, uh, within a matter of few hours into a, in a disaster scenario to various uh, emergency uh, life uh, management facilities. So there we have actually done the disaster drills, which uh, is must, it should be done on ground. And I uh, firmly believe that, you know, uh, at a periodical, uh, you know, quarterly or half yearly, they have to be done on ground involving all uh, stakeholders, including administrators, uh, the healthcare professionals, and uh, your uh, civilians and the patients and, uh, you know, voluntary workers, including NGOs. And once again, my compliments to uh, Dr. Khoram for uh, that excellent predisposition to the evening. And once again, uh, thanks to all the organizers uh, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you so much. 
Dr. Teodoro is a professor of trauma surgery and emergency medicine, University of Philippines. He is a director, trauma, injury and burn care commission, Philippines College of Surgeon Foundation, a special advisor, interagency task force against COVID, board member, Philippines Health Insurance Corporation, former, uh, former health undersecretary of the Philippines, former executive vice president of the University of the Philippines system, former board member of uh, WADEM, former professor of emergency medicine at the University Keban San, Malaysia. Dr. Teodoro, please. Thank you very much to uh, Dr. Bala for that very nice presentation on uh, mass casualty incidents. We all learned with the extensive presentation of Dr. Bala. I too trained in Israel at the Tel Aviv University uh, way back in 1991. And uh, at that time, I had the chance to be able to visit the trauma unit of Hadassah but at that time, it was still the great Dr. Avi Rivkin, who was chief of trauma at that time. So please give my regards to Dr. Avi Rivkin. Uh, I think his presentation clearly uh, exemplifies all the different features of uh, mass casualty incidents. But what he fails to actually uh, tell us is the culture of preparedness that the Israelis have. And this I noticed because uh, Israel is a country that is in conflict with the neighbors, with the uh, organizations that want to abolish them or bomb them or terrorize them. So they're in a level of preparedness that is kind of unique to different, uh, it's not found let's say in the Philippines, in the tropical islands, where we're not as ready when the ISIS came, we weren't as ready as a, a country like Israel. And that's where I think the features of uh, handling uh, mass casualty incidents come in wherein you have to put a lot of interplay of society into the chaos that evolves in the aftermath of a mass casualty incident. Yes, there will be chaos, but in Israel, the, the system is actually unique because all Israeli youth are conscripted to the Israeli Defense Forces. And because they're conscripted, they spend two to three years in the military. And even if they're already in the, or in the medical community, they actually, I think, dedicate still about a month of their year, of every year, to serve in the IDF. And that's why uh, you see the IDF being deployed in many of the uh, humanitarian efforts all over the world. I, I met the Israeli Defense Forces again during Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines when I was the overall coordinator and I actually deployed the IDF forces to an island called Bantayan Island. Everybody wanted to go to Taklo, but I said, no, you go here. And they were very happy because there were no humanitarian agencies going to that island and they did a tremendous amount of system. So that's the first thing we learned from him. There is a system in chaos that uh, is inherent in the nature of the way Israelis think and behave because of where they are. He also elucidated the importance of the five Cs. And I, I, will, I will repeat this for, for emphasis. He talked about contingency planning, very important, command and control, your incident command system, coordination, cooperation, and capacity building. So these are all very important so that you do not repeat errors of previous management in a previous mass casualty incident. And all over this, he emphasized a very important point that we all should learn. The importance of making sure that chaos will disappear that you will be able to reorganize and respond through good communication. So site control through good communication, being able to communicate with other members of the emergency services, from the police to the fire services, to the uh, uh, paramedics or the pre-hospital care, to other doctors in the field or in, in, in the hospital. So that's actually a very important point that he emphasizes. The role of com communications. Again, he also emphasized the challenges in the pre-hospital setting. A pre-hospital setting where you have no resources and you have plenty of needs. So you have needs without, without an adequate amount of resources and you need, he talked about this, he said the importance in a mass casualty incident is to be able to deploy the logistics needed to actually handle a mass casualty incident. And he emphasized that. And I will say that is very important. And he differentiated pre-hospital setting to the hospital setting in the mass casualty incident because his concept is really evacuate them quickly to the hospital where the hospital has all the resources and the specialties, but the hospital needs to surge. 
and he showed the, the typical features of surge with a hospital in Rambam when you have what we call a uh, multi-purpose facility. Uh, I, I trained at King Shiva Medical Center and they also have a whole basement that is used as outpatient surgery, but it's actually a whole hospital as well when the, with a specific airlock for biological and nuclear incidents. So he, he talked about all of these important key elements being able to identify the key personnel that will actually make sure that the chain of command is uh, given out to an orderly manner. So a very important point he mentioned as well is when you save lives in a mass casualty incident, it is important to talk about salvageable cases or what I would term as survivability. We call it uh, lowering, lowering your level of ambition. So in a, in a non-mass casualty incident, you do all your efforts to actually save a particular patient. But in a mass casualty incident, you'd have to recalibrate and re re rethink of who are the ones that will get majority of the resources because you have to ration such resources. So in conclusion, I think the most important part he mentioned in the conclusion, which we all surgeons should learn about this, is the importance of governance in being able to lead a mass casualty incident. So we often forget this. We talk about all the systems, all the communication, but what is important is the leadership shown by surgeons and leaders to make sure that the mass casualty incident is managed. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bala for a very interesting presentation and very much uh, uh, many things and, and shows his wisdom and experience in the field of uh, mass casualty incidents. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Dr. Joel Macalino, for the talk presented by Dr. Daniel Messalken. He is a medical legal consultant at the St. Louis Medical Center, Philippines, Division Chief of the Surgical IC of the Philippine General Hospital, Head Trauma and Critical Care of the Tondo Medical Center. Students of Trauma, welcome, Dr. Joel Macalino. Anyway, this is another presentation involving the Marawi siege. I hope um, I'll be worthy between the uh, first two surgeons who presented regarding this topic. Uh, I hope I can uh, give justice to this. Anyway, this is the Mirawi siege looking at the ethics during this armed conflict. So this started with this uh, Maute group, but when they reached my Pakpak Medical Center, this group actually uh, replace the Philippine flag and replace it with the uh, uh, Islamic State flag, the black flag. And during that time, there were observers who said that uh, uh, hospital staff uh, tells of or, or ha has encounters with women and children warriors. Our president at that time was in Russia. And during that time, he declared martial law while still in Russia talking to Vladimir Putin. At about June 9, the president uh, was already here in the Philippines. Uh, the significant thing about this is that um, he attended the wake of Lieutenant Sevillano, a, one of the Marines. What is more important is that uh, the lieutenant led a team that recovered about 80 million pesos worth in cash and in check. That means that they are ready. No, they have the money. June 12 is the Independence Day of the Philippines. And this was a picture taken by a police officer. At that time, it was uh, the casualty count was 58 among the government troops. A few days later, the military suspended offensive and declared, uh, declared a humanitarian pause because it was the end of Ramadan. So that, uh, there was a eight hour pause, they called the humanitarian pause. At about August 22, when we are gaining some headway, they opened the Mindanao State University, which is in Marawi City. You know, in the Philippines, every time that we have a disaster, the first thing or one of the first thing that is done by the authorities is the open, to open the school open the elementary, open the school to elementary school students. 
um, it's a semblance of normalcy or normal normal things to come in that area of disaster. Now, even the Grand Mosque was not spared. The Grand Mosque uh, was said to be used as a hideout of the terrorists. This is the picture of the Grand Mosque before it was uh, damaged. Now, this is the area, the battle zone of the Marawi, of Marawi City. The one in red is where you have a heavy fighting in the periphery. The yellow uh, areas are the trap residents. This is the running balance. At that time, there were 360 displaced civilians, about 1,200 dead, composed of militants, soldiers, and civilians. And there were about uh, uh, 1,700 1, civilians rescued. Now, these were taken from the piece written by Asminder Singh and Hasis Jani. I took the liberty to um, compile it and uh, differentiate you know, between the two, the um, Philippine Armed Forces and the one flying the black flag. As regards to victory, victory in terms of the Armed Forces would be neutralizing the enemy, recapturing the land, and um, troop advancement. While in the Maute ISIS group, it was to create a humanitarian crisis, probably expose the failure of the government to protect its citizens. As regards to warfare, the difference is that we are ready for jungle wire warfare, but then the Maute ISIS group were ready for the urban warfare. As such, our tech tactics, the armed forces of the Philippines, were conventional and would uh, be dependent on military might, while that of the other group is unconventional with the use of improvised explosive device, suicide bombers, and even the use of hostage. As regards to lessons learned, we learned that uh, we are now thinking about uh, impact of battle in the security of the P Philippines and even the region. While the Maute ISIS group um, learned that the small numbers are very capable of social and physical damage. This was taken from the uh, lecture of Dr. Daniel Meselkin. The three basic questions, is this an armed conflict? Yes, because it is a state versus the ISIS state. Is it a disaster? Again, yes, because there is a great disruption of the community. Is it a complex emergency? I say again, yes, because there is disruption of the livelihood and even threats to life and even civilian lives. These are the doctrines of an ethical war. Well, it may not be or it may not be a just war there was no lawful declaration of war. I don't know the, about the rightful intention. Probably it is dependent on the definition of winning. And that is part of national conventions. Now the main uh, reaction to this is with regard to this uh, Scout Rangers Medical Battalion. The platoon is headed by a military surgeon. We know because uh, we trained him at the AFP Medical Center. They were in a forward position. Well, that is forward position because they were really in the battlefields. They were in the day after the Marawi siege and out clearly after the Marawi siege that is in October 29, 2017. But look at their weapons. No? They are more high-powered weapons, no? probably better than the usual M16. No, they are as proficient in using these high-powered guns as they are in uh, 
putting on the tourniquet for the injured. So my first question, is it, an ethic, is it ethical for the members of the medical battalion or the medical platoon to carry arms? Well, this were also um, talked about in a documentary by Sandra Aguinaldo, that's a newscaster, a news uh, person from the GMA, one of the television stations. And this is what the major in this platoon said the best impact in survivability is to is determined by who is first on the scene he is actually talking about is their way forward position they were able or they are able to help a lot more when they are on the scene this is a team of five people they were there for more than five months they accumulated or they tra treated 443 wounded in action and more than half of them returned to active duty or to duty immediately this is a picture of them placing a um, chest tube my next question would be would being ethical also mean that they also treat any enemy combatants because of their position? They are in a way forward position. And do they distinguish between the military and the enemy combatants? Or would being ethical mean that you do not distinguish between the two? In October 17, 2017, the government allocated 20 billion pesos for the rehabilitation of this uh, war-torn city. And uh, they thought that uh, two, it would take two to three years for the rebuilding. Well, as an update, last January 2, they already are ready with the Grand Mosque. They were able to rebuild it. And they are near ready with the residences of the people affected. So before Marawi City is called the Islamic City of Serenity by the lake. So thank you very much.